We've all grown up with the familiarity of nursery rhymes, singing them without a second thought. Yet what if these seemingly innocent tunes harbour more mysterious origins? Have you ever pondered where they emerged and when we began passing them down to our children? Take, for instance, Sing a Song of Sixpence, a seemingly charming rhyme that conceals peculiar imagery. Blackbirds baked inside a pie, a royal trio of a king, queen and maid, and the unsettling notion of a nose being pecked off. What intriguing stories lie behind these verses? Welcome back, Darklings. Before we embark on unravelling its origins, let's first reacquaint ourselves with the curious verses of this rhyme. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds, baked in a pie. When the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish, to set before the king? The king was in his counting house, counting out his money. The queen was in the parlour, eating bread and honey. The maid was in the garden, hanging out the clothes, when down came a blackbird and pecked off her nose. In some versions of the rhyme, there exists a variation where the maid's nose is replaced by either a wren or the king's doctor, but that seems to be a late 19th century addition. Tracing the origins of nursery rhymes is a formidable task, given their often oral beginnings and the loss of historical texts. Yet, this particular rhyme offers some intriguing hints regarding its birth date. The introduction of the sixpence coin into English circulation in 1551 is a notable clue. References to singing a song for sixpence can be discerned in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night from 1602, where Sir Toby Belch offers a clown sixpence in exchange for a song. Likewise, Beaumont and Fletcher's 1614 play Bonduca echoes this phrase with a character mentioning, sing a song of sixpence. Evidently, the concept of compensating entertainers with sixpence for singing their songs was well established and widely recognised in the 1600s. Moreover, the notion of blackbirds concealed within a pie offers another clue that the roots of this rhyme might lie in the 17th century. A cookbook dating back to 1598 contains a recipe describing firstly the baking of a pie crust, followed by cutting a hole in the bottom, then the insertion of live birds, and the presentation of the pie on a dish, so that when it was cut open at the table, the birds would take flight. This blackbird pie was never designed with the intention of being consumed. These culinary marvels, known as subtleties, were designed to astonish, and were often served as interludes between courses at royal banquets. Of course, they were anything but subtle. The name is taken from an older word meaning to surprise. They took various forms, from sugar-crafted castles to birds prepared and redecorated in their own plumage. It is such a banquet that could be the real-life inspiration for Sing a Song of Sixpence. The year 1600 witnessed the union of Marie de Medici and Henry IV of France in a wedding that holds captivating parallels to the rhyme. The grand stage was meticulously prepared for this extravagant spectacle, where an elaborate banquet unfolded, forever etching its place in history as one of the most opulent and lavishly staged nuptial feasts ever witnessed. Amidst the courses, live songbirds emerged from guests' napkins, their dramatic flights enchanting all. The grand finale arrived with a dessert of milk and honey sorbet, served in delicate bowls, a treat so exquisite that it was hailed as the highlight of the entire meal. But beneath the surface of this grand union lay complex motives. France was burdened by a substantial debt owed to Marie de Medici's father, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, who had provided crucial support for the king's war efforts. The Medici family, renowned bankers of the French monarchy, didn't just offer Marie as a bride, but also a generous cash lump sum, effectively cancelling France's debt. This generous offering was further complemented by an immense dowry, offering financial salvation to the king. And so, the notion of the king in his counting house counting out his money finds a vivid embodiment in this extravagant wedding where finances were intricately tied to the grandeur of the occasion. The saying to put someone's nose out of joint conveys the idea of offending or upsetting someone, often by acquiring something they desired for themselves. This idiom was first documented back in 1581, so it's intriguing to consider whether the tale of the maid who had her nose pecked off might symbolise the king's former lover, Henriette de Balzac d'Entragues. King Henry had previously made promises of marriage to her, and her bitter reference to the new queen, Marie, as the big banker, fuelled by resentment over the queen's substantial dowry essentially buying the king, hints at a rift. It appears that Henriette's aspirations were thwarted, 
and her nose was figuratively put out of joint by this royal union. In a remarkable eyewitness account, history comes alive as we see these two women encounter each other for the first time at an official function. As Henriette was introduced to the Queen, King Henry took the unusual step of explaining, Mademoiselle has been my mistress, she will be your most obedient servant. The room fell into an eerie stillness as the Queen was taken aback by this unexpected revelation. Henriette gracefully bowed, while the King, usually known for his etiquette, did something completely uncharacteristic. He laid a hand on Henriette's head, pushing her to her knees, and compelled her to kiss the hem of the Queen's gown. This unforgettable incident left a mark on both women, setting the stage for a turbulent relationship. Less than a year later, the tension between them deepened when they both gave birth to the King's sons within days of each other. Henriette's spite would eventually lead her to become embroiled in a plot against the King in 1606, further complicating this entangled web of history. In the digital realm, the most popular theory to explain the origins of Sing a Song of Sixpence holds a swashbuckling charm and a touch of treachery. It involves the notorious pirate Blackbeard and suggests that he cleverly concealed a code within the verses, an invitation meant to beckon the boldest souls to join him on his perilous voyages. The Blackbirds represent Blackbeard's pirates. Baked in a pie symbolizes their strategic ploy to capture a nearby ship by hiding below deck. Eating bread and honey signifies Blackbeard's ship, the Queen Anne's revenge preparing for a raid by stocking supplies. The Maid is the targeted prize ship, the Garden is the Caribbean Sea, and hanging out the clothes refers to the sails of the captured vessel. This captivating saga took its maiden voyage in 1999 when a website called The Repository of Lost Legends unveiled this interpretation. It rapidly set sail through cyberspace, becoming a sensation. It even made a prominent appearance on a popular television series which presented this pirate theory as the rhyme's origin and established historical fact. Yet, in the labyrinth of the online world, even the most captivating tales have their secrets. The creators of the Repository of Lost Legends, or Troll, to take their acronym, have since come forward with a revelation. They confessed that it was all a clever ruse, a playful hoax intended to amuse, but one that had no basis in historical fact and had spiralled far beyond their control. In the end, Sing a Song of Sixpence may not harbour hidden pirate codes, but the story of its digital escapade reminds us that the internet is a vast, untamed sea of information where captivating tales can emerge, take root and leave us spellbound. The word pie unveils a fascinating and intricate journey through linguistic history and is rooted in the Latin word pica. Before pie became synonymous with the delectable dish we enjoy, it was a word used to reference the magpie bird. The addition of mag came later, after the culinary connotation of pie had taken root. Pika or pie was used to describe the striking contrast between light and dark, whether it was the black and white plumage of the magpie or the coat of a piebald horse. In the realm of printing, it symbolised the interplay of dark letters against white paper. The choice of pie to describe the food item remains unclear. It could be attributed to the striking contrast between a pale crust and a rich dark filling, or perhaps it was influenced by the magpie's penchant for collecting a diverse array of objects, mirroring the idea that a pie can be filled with an assortment of ingredients. In the 1580s, pica was employed to denote a specific type print size, much like our contemporary use of points to size fonts. Simultaneously, pie served as printer's slang, denoting a disorderly collection of type. Could it be that instead of referring to a culinary pie, the rhyme is referencing book printing? Perhaps then, the blackbirds in the rhyme symbolise letter blocks covered in black ink, poised and ready for printing. 4 and 20 represents an Old English way of denoting 24, while the Old English Latin alphabet typically consisted of 24 letters. The pie therefore might allude to the printing of the Great Bible of 1539, the first English edition of the Bible, authorised by King Henry VIII during the English Reformation. Some question the symbolism of the blackbirds, theorising that they might symbolise monks in black habits. In this interpretation, the king in his counting house evokes Henry VIII, benefiting from the dissolution of monasteries and land seizures as he declared himself the head of the English church. 
The queen could symbolize Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and the maid in the garden hanging out her clothes might be representing Anne Boleyn, who, for her failure to produce a male heir, met a far grimmer fate than simply having her nose pecked off. Folklorists draw parallels between the rhyme and ancient mythology, highlighting Blackbird's twilight activity as symbolic of the interplay between light and darkness. Woven into Celtic beliefs, Blackbirds were regarded as messengers bridging the realms of the living and the dead, symbolising both death and rebirth. The intriguing notion of these birds returning to life after being cooked may echo this association. Rhiannon, a Celtic goddess associated with three mystical birds, likely blackbirds, derives her name from common Britonic, meaning queen. Her avian companions are said to sing a song capable of both waking the dead and lulling the living to sleep. The maid losing her nose could be significant too. Nasal mutilation served as a ritual punishment for adultery. Historical records and recent archaeological discoveries, like an Anglo-Saxon girl's skull with a severed nose, confirm this ancient practice. Biblical references also include nose cutting as a punishment for adultery. Some argue that the original intention of the rhyme didn't involve a pie, but instead referred to a pyre, a stack of combustible materials used for burning deceased bodies. This interpretation suggests a connection to funeral rituals or even sacrificial altars. These observations hint at the possibility that the rhyme possesses ancient origins, suggesting a darker and more complex history than initially imagined. Another often cited theory behind Sing a Song of Sixpence suggests that it was penned by the literary critic George Stevens as a satirical jab at the work of the poet laureate, Henry James Pye. Pye had secured the poet laureate position as a political reward for his support of William Pitt the Younger in Parliament, despite his lacklustre poetic abilities, making him one of the least esteemed poet laureates in English history. One notable example of his uninspiring work was a poem celebrating King George III, filled with references to a feathered choir. In response, George Stevens is said to have humorously quipped, and when the pie was opened, the birds began to sing. Wasn't that a dainty dish to set before the king? George Stevens, known for his wit and penchant for humor, might have very well composed a verse mentioning pie. However, it's worth noting that the timelines may not perfectly align, raising some doubts about this theory. The rhyme's earliest surviving publication can be traced back to 1744 in Tommy Thumb's Pretty Songbook. This version features only the initial few lines, devoid of any mention of a king, queen or maid. Notably, this predates the appointment of Henry Pye as Poet Laureate by 50 years. The complete and most widely recognised version of the rhyme as we know it today first emerges in Gamma Girton's Garland from the year 1784. When exploring the historical roots of songs and stories, it is imperative to approach publication dates with caution, considering the inevitable loss of old books over time and the scarcity of documentation prior to widespread literacy. The coexistence of multiple versions of the rhyme is plausible, particularly when considering the oral tradition that facilitated the passing on of these rhymes through generations. The omission of the full rhyme might also be attributed to the compact format of Tommy Thumb's songbook, designed to comfortably fit in a child's hand. Given the book's petite size, with each page dedicated to a single nursery rhyme, it's conceivable that Sing a Song of Sixpence was abbreviated to accommodate the limited space available on the page. Nevertheless, there does appear to be a notable contrast between the initial lines, evoking seemingly older 17th century imagery, and the subsequent part of the rhyme that alludes to the king, queen and maid. This raises the possibility that these could be two distinct nursery rhymes amalgamated over time, with the first half potentially originating from a much earlier period and the second half being a more recent addition. The earliest published version also features a more macabre variant in the form of four and twenty naughty boys, rather than blackbirds. This sinister twist could be interpreted either as a straightforward cautionary tale urging good behaviour in children, or intriguingly, it may allude to the unsettling notion of cannibalism. But there may be a more straightforward explanation. The term pie, documented from 1533 to the 1700s, carries sexual connotations, serving as slang for a woman's intimate anatomy. In this context, the reference to naughty boys takes on a more coherent meaning. Maybe there are 24 boys symbolizing each hour of the day to subtly reference themes related to prostitution. 
As we've noted, the commonplace practice of compensating entertainers with sixpence for a song was well established. While the line about a bag full of rye might nod to bread making, the dual usage of rye in brewing beer and other alcoholic drinks adds depth to the interpretation. When pieced together, it paints a picture more akin to a provocative and bawdy 1600s tavern ballad. If we assume, therefore, that the lines about the king, queen and maid were added around the time of its 1784 publication, it raises the intriguing possibility that the king referred to is George III. While George III is often remembered as the mad king of England, his reign was marked by significant historical events. He presided over Britain's acquisition of an empire in the Seven Years' War, the loss of the American colonies, and the nation's emergence as a leading power in Europe after the struggles against revolutionary and Napoleonic France. A notable aspect of King George III's rule was the restructuring of the relationship between the Crown and the government. Unlike his predecessors, who possessed vast wealth in property and possessions but minimal income, King George relinquished the Crown estates to the government. In return, he received a regular income funded by taxpayers to support his household and to cover expenses, an arrangement that persists to this day. Could the depiction of the king counting money in the rhyme be a reflection of this bold historical move? This implies the queen referenced is likely Charlotte, King George III's wife, which just leaves the maid. The more observant among you might have noticed a departure from the traditional image of a maid hanging laundry in the original publication, as she is described as laying out clothes. Furthermore, the rhyme features a magpie, not a blackbird, snatching her nose. The term garden has historically been a slang reference to a woman's genitalia since 1620. In the 16th and 17th centuries, syphilis, a highly stigmatised disease, often led to the loss of one's nose, bringing severe social consequences. To hide this shame, some used prosthetic noses crafted from silver and enamelled to mimic flesh, potentially explaining the magpie's theft. Consequently, the maid in the rhyme may symbolise a woman scorned for perceived promiscuity and linked to the affliction of syphilis. Perhaps this is a cruel nod towards Miss Elizabeth Chudley, a maid of honour in Queen Charlotte's court. Elizabeth, a dazzling figure at court, enchanted aristocratic gentlemen with her beauty and mesmerising storytelling. Her journey into the intricate tapestry of love and scandal began with Augustus John Hervey, the future third Earl of Bristol. They met at a Winchester race, sparking a whirlwind courtship that culminated in a secret marriage in 1744. Their union, kept secret to allow Elizabeth to maintain her court position, faced challenges during Hervey's two-year naval tour, casting Elizabeth into a whirlpool of intrigue. Fending off proposals and maintaining her covert marriage proved taxing, especially as rumours of flirtations during Hervey's absence strained their marriage, leading to a mutual separation. Elizabeth's penchant for stirring controversy reached its climax at a masquerade ball during the King's Jubilee celebration, Wearing a daring costume, she shocked her peers, her fellow maids of honour refusing to speak to her. Yet, George II found it delightful, even playfully asking her if he could touch her breast. Elizabeth replied that she knew something softer to the touch, and taking his hand, placed it on his own head. Far from being offended by her remark, the king laughed and appeared enchanted. Undeterred by her tumultuous past, Elizabeth entered into a short-lived joyous union with Evelyn Pierpont, the second Duke of Kingston upon Hull, renowned as one of England's most handsome men. Their happiness, however, was brief, as the Duke's untimely demise left Elizabeth widowed after only four years. In his will, the Duke bequeathed all his possessions to Elizabeth, under the condition that she remained a widow. Only upon her demise would his relatives inherit. This stipulation caused an uproar within his family, leading to accusations of bigamy against Miss Chudley, given her prior marriage to Hervey. The ensuing sensational court trial gripped London society, with daily attendance by notable figures, including a visibly pregnant Queen Charlotte. The press extensively covered the case, portraying Elizabeth as a calculating gold digger, and the verdict in the end declared her guilty. Fleeing to Paris, Elizabeth's tale left a lasting mark on the chronicles of scandalous court histories. Although there's no conclusive evidence tying Miss Chudley's narrative to the particular line in the rhyme about the maid losing her nose, her scandalous reputation stirred significant attention and sparked numerous satirical illustrations, often depicting her half-naked in a provocative manner. 
But what do you think? Do any of these theories stand out to you? Or maybe you have your own ideas? Leave a comment and share your thoughts. Your insights could add an exciting dimension to the ongoing exploration of this mystery. And if your thirst for nursery rhyme origins still lingers, be sure to subscribe and explore the rest of my channel. See you in a future video.